I love to hear how you all get quiet when I stand up here. It's like, I'm just listening in what you're talking about, that's all. Anyway, good morning. Welcome to St. Paul Church. We're glad you're here this morning. I have a few announcements to underscore. The first one, because Sue told me this and I actually didn't highlight it, so I'm so glad she did, is following the worship service, there is going to be a choir practice for those who want to sing for the patriotic concert, which will actually be in two weeks. So that's my announcement on the patriotic concert also. And then um, bell choir this Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. My basic understanding for bell choir is if you can count one, two, three, four. Do you have to count more than that? Not very often. Not very often. <laughs> All right. Now, you'll notice me at, now in my 13th year here, it's like, or 12th year, whatever the year it is, I cannot count and have music at the same time, so therefore I can't play bells. I also have no rhythm. Um, then, uh, this is an announcement will be in the newsletter, but uh, there's two of them here. The prime timers, we're going to have a pasta party in November, on November 20th, and um, I, I did kind of wear this tie to remind me I'm going to be showing my pictures from Kenya. You will see me much younger, darker hair, and um, maybe a little lighter. Probably, probably, probably a little lighter. And uh, I'm pretty sure there's one on me on my motorcycle too, so that's the scariest part of that. Um, then ladies' night out, as far as I know, there's three tickets still available, so if you're interested in that, uh, call Don Demas or call the office. We'll get you hooked up with that. And then um, I got something else here that I knew I wanted to announce. And I, I, I know I have the OCC video here. Um, all right. You might get it later because I might remember it. But we're going to have a Operation Christmas Child video. And then Jan Boyer is going to have just a little follow-up from the video um, for that. So we're glad you're here today. And uh, we'll... Hopefully start that video. Three, two, one. When that shoe box when that shoe they're box overjoyed, over you can see them shouting, jumping. Oh, look at how much they are excited. This is the first time those children are receiving the shoe boxes. They are so happy. You can hear the laughter, you can hear the cheer, that excitement, it goes and goes and goes. Right now we're in Ukraine and today we've given out the 200 million shoe box to a little girl here. So it's a lot of fun. It's a privilege for us to be able to come and to help the people as much as we can. Every box is important because every box is an opportunity to tell a child about God's love, about His Son, Jesus Christ. There's so much joy that one gift box can give. They really experience the love of Jesus. At Operation Christmas Show, we celebrate something as simple as the shoe box because God uses it to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We got a full box on 15. This is such an amazing time. We're so happy to be here. This shoe box gift will impact a child's life all year round. We never dreamed we'd have an army of men and women who would come to make this program happen. This is what it's all about. Telling others about Jesus. This shoe box is going to 120 different countries where pastors and missionaries are going to use them to bring the gospel to kids. So you may think it's just a simple gift at Christmas time, but it's the gift of the gospel, the story of Jesus Christ. When that shoe box leaves that distribution center and it goes around the world, that's not just one person. That's the body of Christ joined together delivering the good news of the gospel. They go by plane, they go by ship, they go by riverboat, they go by camels, they go by motorbikes. And these boxes go to some of the most remote areas of the world. And every box counts. After receiving shoe boxes, children are invited to participate in the Greatest Journey Discipleship Program. These children have just completed 12 lessons in the Greatest Journey. I believe that discipleship is the key and they are now followers of Christ. They will tell their friends about Jesus. My name is Gladys and I am 9 years old. My friend Kemi told me I needed to go with her to church. 
I wanted to teach her about the Word of God. And when she came to my church, she received a gift box. For a long time, I asked my mom for a blanket. When I opened my shoe box, I found a blanket in it. When I came home, I showed it to my mom, and she said it was great. I told her about Jesus. Now me, my mom, my grandma, and Kemi go to church together. I am certain of one thing. God is my savior. Every box counts. Every box touches a child. It's like a snowflake. There's not one shoebox that is the same. And we are reaching millions of children with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you get the heart of the child, you will reach the heart of the parents, you will reach the heart of the family, and then you will touch the community. We are seeing churches being planted, and more and more churches are being built. We will do whatever it takes to reach the ends of the earth with the gospel. That gift box is the beginning into their hearts. Isn't it incredible how these gifts touch the lives of these children? The joy, the smiles, it changes lives. Every year we see tens of thousands of children discipled. And we couldn't do this without you, so thank you for packing the boxes. Thank you for praying for these children around the world. God bless you, and keep packing those boxes. Um, I don't feel the need to say a whole lot because we've done this here at St. Paul for many years and um, so you know a lot of the information but I just wanted to touch on um, and it was in the video that there have been over 200 million shoe boxes that have been given to children so that's you know that's just huge and they've been distributed in 170 countries around the world so um, the offering today is primarily uh, is designated for OCC, and it will go primarily to help cover our, our shipping costs. So our goal this year, and we're not quite there, we've got a couple of packing parties yet to go this year, but we um, are looking to pack 900 boxes. So that's $9,000 in shipping costs. But Diane Shirk took one of our boxes to the Rock City Post Office to see it was a, th <clears throat> excuse me, it was a three pound box. And we packed really, really nice boxes here at St. Paul Church, thanks to all of our shoppers and packers and everything. But th it was a three pound box to, um, and, sh and it was going to be shipped to the capital city of Zambia, where a lot of our boxes from last year went. So for somebody to ship that themselves, it would be $65. And then she was told that there'd be no guarantee that the box would even get there. So the $10 shipping cost through Samaritan's Purse is a huge, huge bargain. Um, we're well on our way to the $9,000 that we need for shipping costs, and that includes the um, gospel opportunity um, that, that um, will go to the children so that they can um, receive more information and hopefully be brought to um, to Christ through their shoebox. Um, now I just lost my train of thought right there. So, <laughs> but we are well on our way, and we've received money um, towards that from the garage sale this year. Some of the proceeds from this year's garage sale here at church, um, from the bake sale held at my house during the Route 75 garage sales, and just your. Um, little coin change containers. Last week at Awana, the kids brought in their change containers and they had almost $250 just from the Awana kids, so it touches my heart. Um, so thank you in advance. Thank you for all of our shoppers, everybody that comes and helps pack. If you would like more information on it, there are so many people that you can talk to. We're going to Aurora on um, the the Monday and the Wednesday following Thanksgiving, if you would like to 
see the next step in that process and go to the processing center, just talk to Sal or Val or me or Patty's been there, Carol, Betty, you know, there's just been so many, Vicki and Lonnie, um, lots of people to talk to. So thank you in advance for your generosity today through our offering. So the announcement I forgot, which I knew I would get to sooner or later, is that uh, Dakota, um, the Rock Run Historical Society, this was handed to me this morning, so, um, is doing a presentation this Thursday um, at Dakota Fire uh, Station on Dakota Community Church, its history and ties to Dakota School for Boys, which I didn't realize that there was a Dakota School for Boys. And next Sunday is Trunk or Treating, uh, so if you haven't signed up either for a trunk or for being getting treats, we encourage you to do that on the bulletin board. Now, will you join me in singing hymn number 552 on Jordan's Stormy Banks? <laughs>
I invite you now to join me in the call to worship. The time came when the beggar died and the angel carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. Father, hear our cries and the challenges, Lord, that we face as we think of heaven and we think of hell. Not many people, Lord, desire to go to hell. Many want to go to heaven but don't want to follow the path to get there through you as our Savior. So, Father, today you are here with us through your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit will speak to each one of us and that we receive from him that which we hear through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. We're going to be singing number 335, and we'll sing it through twice. Prayer is a wonderful thing that we get to do corporately. Of course, it's even better, I suppose, when we're doing it at home. And we just sang, turn our eyes upon Jesus, look into his wonderful face. And the things on earth will grow strangely dim. And I always say, those are the things that are flashing lights in our heads that we want to be dim, but they are so much right in front of us, whether it's a sickness, whether it's a trial, whether it's a challenge. Those are just neon lights flashing on us. When we have our eyes at Jesus, on Jesus and we look at those things in our life that are difficult for us, they should dim because we know the end of the story as far as our faith in Christ. So as we come together in a time of silent prayer, those burdens that you're carrying today, God wants to hear from you. But try to look at them through the eyes of Jesus. Try to look at them and see the dimness and the glory of Jesus and the dimness of those burdens that we have. Let's pray together silently. Heavenly Father, I pray right now, Lord, for each one here, 
those who might be listening today or tomorrow or someday online, that the burdens that each one is carrying, Lord, they would see that burden through your eyes, that you're in control, that you got it covered. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but your grace is sufficient for all of our needs. The ones that we cry out that are big, that are huge. And the little needs, Lord, that we sometimes don't even want to come to you because we don't think you care about it. Remind us, Lord, that you care about every part of who we are, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Whatever the dynamic, Lord, you are there and you are sufficient for whatever need we have. We recognize historically, Lord, that the disciples went through tough times. Many of them were martyred. But Father, they never went ahead and grew dim of the message of Jesus Christ. They wanted to live for you. So Lord, as we pray the prayer you taught our disciple, your disciples, remind us, Lord, that this prayer is for us also. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. We too. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue in our worship as we wait on you for his tithes and our offerings. Praise you, Father, for the gift and the giver. And Lord, we ask you take these tithes and our offerings. And we recognize, Lord, the blessing of your kingdom as your word will go out through Operation Christmas Child and the boxes, Lord, that will be packed and the boxes that will be sent. 
And so we just thank you, Lord, for being a part of the privilege of reaching people for Jesus Christ. Amen. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 22. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, they are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. But these people blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They are like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed. And like animals, they too will perish. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bezer, who loved the wages of wickedness. But he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, an animal without speech, who spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These people are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them, for they mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity, for people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. If they have escaped the corruption of the world, by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them the proverb is true, a dog returns to its vomit and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, again, your word, a little lengthier today than maybe what we're used to, but it's a challenge to us, Lord, but it is also the opportunity to see who you are to see how judgment will come on false teachers. In reality, Lord, it's not a pretty picture for them. But there is hope for us in the midst of your word, and we can give thanks for that. So thank you 
for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. I read a story about a five-year-old boy, and he was trying to explain the angels that fell from heaven to his younger sister. So this is what he said. One day, up in heaven, God said to the angels, it's now time to pick up your toys and put them away. And some of the angels said, no, we're not going to do that. And so the little boy told his sister, that's how God started hell. Now I'm going to tell you that um, the, the simple side of my life, that was not a word that I was allowed to use when I was growing up. Made very clear by my parents for that. In my research this week, I found only a couple of hum humorous illustrations about hell. Yet oftentimes, hell is almost talked about like it doesn't really exist. I remember talking with somebody about whether they thought they were going to heaven or hell. And their response was, well, I guess I'm planning to go to hell so I can be with my friends. It kind of caught me by surprise. Now, when it comes to people who do evil, whether it's to us or somebody who we love or so somebody else, I have often heard this comment, I hope that person, that evil person, burns in hell. Now, I've also heard from many people over the years that when they've had a hard day and you ask them how they're doing, that you hear this response, it's been a hell of a day. I remember talking to my mother-in-law, talking one day, and I was just kind of approaching the subject of heaven for her. She grew up in a different tradition than I did, and so in that course of conversation, I said to her, I said, Mom, do you believe that when you die, you're going to heaven? Now, that's the assurance that we like to have for our loved one. Mom went ahead and responded, yes, because it's been hell here on earth. Now, you've probably heard that before also from other people. Now, I need to add that my mother-in-law did have a faith in Jesus, but she had been through a tough day. And I'm pretty sure now that I have mentioned that word hell probably seven to eight times, and I don't think I've ever mentioned it that many times in a sermon in 40 years of ministry. Well, We've been studying 2 Peter now for four weeks or so. Verses 1 through 3 last week, we learned quite a bit about false teachers. But I have to tell you, Peter didn't just stop with verse 3. The rest of chapter 2 keeps us focused again on these false teachers. So this morning I want to emphasize three lessons that we can glean really from the rest of chapter 2. And I'm sure I could have come up with more lessons, but I have to tell you I struggled with this chapter. I don't like false teachers. I don't like researching them. I don't like looking into them and that type of thing. And as I go ahead and I struggle with people, I also struggle with those who I know who have fallen prey to false teachers. And my heart goes out to them. When it comes to false teachers, yes, I like Peter's description. I like what he's talking about here. But for those who fall prey to them, my heart just goes out to them and I don't understand. As I've read and reread this chapter, I get angry, I get mad. Glad I didn't have a doctor's appointment, pretty sure my blood pressure would have went up. But I can tell you there's still hope in the midst of what Peter writes, what the Holy Spirit gave him. So here's what I want to share with you. The first lesson I gleaned from this chapter is that there are a lot more characteristics of false teachers than what we had in those first three verses last week. Last week we focused on the heresy that they taught. We focused on their bad behavior, which oftentimes is obvious, and then their greed. And I wasn't happy with those subjects personally. But Peter then goes ahead and says, nope, there's more. 
So in verses 10 through 15, Peter describes more characteristics of false teachers. So let me start in verse 10. The false teacher will follow corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Now, I, I looked at that and I realized that corrupt desire of the flesh, that matches up with bad behavior. We talked about that last week. But the despising authority, that should be obvious, but oftentimes it's not. 30 years ago, almost to the month or so, this is September, I was ordained as a pastor, and I had already been in ministry for 10 years before that took place. But when I got ordained, I placed myself under the authority of the denomination that went ahead and ordained me. And even now, I serve in a different denomination. I sign an affirmation statement every year, and I signed my most recent statement just over a week ago, and here's what it says. I affirm that I remain in the firm agreement, firm agreement with the 4C statement of faith. There's a document that I go ahead and agree to. I affirm that I will remain committed to the principles of the 4C statement of polity. That describes how we work. And then the last one, I affirm that will help, with the help of Almighty God, I will seek to live my life of Christian ministry in accordance with the 4C code of ethics for ministers. Now, should I go against this statement of faith? If I break the principles of the 4C statement of polity or the 4C code of ethics, I'll be held accountable. But here's the rub. Often pastors break the rules and then they go ahead and ignore the authority and they go someplace else and they start a new church. And I can show you that from a historical perspective. And that should be a major warning to any Christian who sits under the tutelage of that particular pastor. Verse 10 goes on to say that false teachers heap abuse on celestial beings. The ESV translation, they blaspheme the glorious ones. The New Living Translation, these people are proud and arrogant, daring even to scoff at supernatural beings without as much as trembling. As a teacher, as a Bible teacher, I think it's important that I teach what I know and I shouldn't be teaching what I don't know. And as a false teacher teaches blasphemies, heaps abuse on things they don't understand, which I always find amazing, and what happens with believers also? For unbelievers, it's amazing for me in my years of ministry, unbelievers belittle Christian values. They belittle things of God as though they have read the Bible and you know they haven't. Oh, they know a verse or two, but they've never dealt with the full counsel of God's word. And so they'll share their opinions on the Bible without examining really what the Bible says. In verses 13 and 14, we learn that false teachers carouse in broad daylight. They sin openly. One of the unique things about false teachers is that they come from within the Christian community. They come from within our congregations all through the world. The last part of verse 13, it says they revel in their pleasures while they feast with you. Church is having a party. Church is having a potluck. Church is having this. And false teachers are right there among the people. Verse 14, it says, They, the false teachers, never stop sinning. False teachers have fellowship with good believers. They are nice. They look right. They even act right. But their goal is to deceive. And from this section, the final point comes from verse 15. Peter mentions Balaam. You may not know who Balaam is. Balaam was a prophet hired by King Balak, Numbers chapter 22 through chapter 24. But Balaam was paid 
to go ahead and speak, prophesy against Israel. In the passage that we read in our text here, it simply says that Balaam loved the wages of wickedness. He loved the money and was willing to pursue it instead of obeying God. So God used a donkey, and it was Balaam's donkey. Been that way for years. Balaam didn't notice the angel of God that was in front of him, and you'll have to read the rest of the story on your own, but I have to tell you that in reading this chapter, you learn about a God's prophet, sort of, who's not doing the right thing, but you also learn in this text from today that there are false teachers and there are plenty of them. I was reminded for myself and Sue and I have a dear friend of the family who goes to a church that teaches that Jesus has already come back. The second coming has already taken place. And she's ignored what scripture says about Jesus' second coming and adamantly sticks to what she's been taught regardless of scripture, but I'm sure that church has twisted scripture. And this friend has basically destroyed the relationship that she has with her kids. And she won't listen to her kids as they point out the truths of scripture. False teachers attempt to make the teachings look like true biblical teachings. They just make the subtle changes so nobody notices. They often target new Christians. And they also target believers who are going through difficult times. Now, if you came to my office on Thursday morning, late in the morning, and asked me how I was doing, I might have given you an earful of disgust because of the research I was doing. This was a challenge. Now, I tell you, I mellowed after lunch. I got back to God's plan for these false teachers, and his plan is much better than mine. So the second lesson I learned from the rest of chapter 2 is that God's plan for their punishment is eternal. It's going to happen, and it's going to keep happening to them. So God's plan is better than mine. Now, I will tell you that before lunch, I wrote this part. I came up with thinking a fire, firing squad would be good. I know that's not really the nice thing. Poison. But then I went back to seventh grade history in England, and that's where I learned that there's a punishment called being hung, drawn, and quartered. I got to tell you, I get frustrated when I hear about false teachers, but God does have a plan. So let me start with just the bullet points all through chapter 2. In verse 1, we saw this last week, they bring swift destruction on themselves. I might add that they don't do it fast enough for my own liking. Verse 3, their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping. It's coming, folks. From verse 12, like beasts, they too will perish. Verse 13, they will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Selfishly, I, I do like that one. I want to exact a pound of flesh out of them. That's not my job, though. And the last one, verse 17, blackest darkness is reserved for them. Now, I would have, that particular verse, I would have preferred to have it say, the fires of hell will not escape them. And that's where Peter reminds us, though, of the punishments that God has provided, that he provides. So in verse 4, Peter starts out with a reminder. He's already identified those three major components of a false teacher. And now he's going ahead. Let me bring you to the punishment of the false teachers. And in verse 4, he starts out with a reminder of hell. Location where the angels who, were, who sinned were sent and locked away in darkness. And they are waiting God's judgment. Hell is a real place. And it's not pretty. And it's a future judgment 
which will only make it worse for them. And the false teachers will be punished, just like those fallen angels. And then I had to keep reading and listen to what Jesus now says about hell, or use the term Hades. The full passage was part of our call to worship. I got to tell you, the call to worship was, again, not the most exciting. You're reading it like, what in the world are we doing today with these verses? In Luke chapter 16, verse 23, we hear that hell is a constant torment. In Mark chapter 9, verse 43, we're told that hell is a place where the fire never goes out. In Mark chapter 9, 48, the worms don't die. And then from Matthew chapter 13, verse 42, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus actually spoke more, if you read the New Testament, read the Gospels, he spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. Now the Holy Spirit knew that there would be people like me in the world who believed in hell, who believed in eternal punishment for sinners, but who also liked the instant gratification for punishment of the ungodly. There's no question about God's forgiveness is available to everybody. But in verse 5, we read this, that God brought on the flood on the ungodly people, sparing Noah and his family. Verses 6 through 8, about the burning and destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah while Lot and his family were saved. And as I thought about this, you see worldwide punishment with Noah and the flood. You see regional punishment with Sodom and Gomorrah. We didn't put this passage in, Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 5. Peter is there as a witness to the punishment in the local church to Ananias and Sapphira. Peter witnessed their death. Peter is reminding us of God's power, of God's justice, of his judgment, The damage that false teachers were doing in the early church made Peter angry. And I have to tell you, it was not unchristian. He was not unchristlike in his anger. In reality, he was reacting just like Jesus, being upset with the money changers in the temple. In John's account, from John chapter 2, verse 15, Jesus made a whip and he drove out the animals and the people from the temple. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus goes ahead and he is describing the teachers of the law, the Pharisees. And what does he call them? Hypocrites. Blind guides, whitewashed tombs, snakes, and a brood of vipers. And just for a bonus statement, Jesus says in Matthew 23, verse 33, you snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? We live in a world today that likes the idea of God's love, likes the idea of God's grace, but lives in denial of God's power and his justice. I will tell you that our society is happy with the church when it focuses on Jesus' words and offers the resources of love and grace. But as we have seen in our world, when we hold the whole counsel of God's word, our society doesn't like it. Our society doesn't like the idea of God's power and justice and that there will be punishment for those who don't have a relationship with Jesus. That's tough to live out our faith. Peter shares these two stories of Noah, and he says, yeah, Noah happened, but God delivered the faithful. Sodom and Gomorrah happened, and God delivered the faithful. The punishment for the false teachers will happen in God's timing. But let's now bring the hope that we can have. You see, in chapter 2, there's always hope for the faithful. You and I, if we have a relationship with Jesus, we're going to be delivered. Listen once again to verses 8 and 9. 
For that righteous man, which is referring to Lot, living among them day after day, was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and he heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. Think about all the other angels who didn't rebel. I mean, that's the ones we're most familiar with. They're in heaven. They are enjoying fellowship with God. They've been delivered. Noah and his family were delivered. Death was all around them when they came out of the ark. Lot and his family witnessed Sodom and Gomorrah, but they were delivered. Our God is a deliverer. Our faith in Jesus delivers us not only from the pit of hell, but from the uncertainty of our life here on earth. I cherish the security that I have in my faith for all my tomorrows. It's a man by the name of Glenn Keane. He's the son of Bill Keane. You might remember him from the comic strip. But Glenn Keane worked as a Disney animator. He was famous. He drew Ariel for The Little Mermaid. He did The Beast. He did Aladdin. He worked on those movies. But he struggled in his faith. He grew up in a different faith, Christian faith, different church. But he struggled about guilt, his sins. He felt condemned in his sins, and he was looking for relief for his guilt. He had a colleague at work whose name was Ron Husband who was reading a Bible, and during the lunch hour, Keen went over to him and said, what are you reading? And of course, it was the Bible. It was a New Testament that actually he took out of a hotel room, so it would have been a Gideon Bible. And he gave it to Keen. And he, during his lunch hour, he kept reading, and he got to John 3.16, which was where the page was turned to, as uh, his friend Ron was going ahead and reading that. And he's reading it and reading it, and finally he found himself saying out loud, I believe, I believe. It was suddenly, he wrote, it was like suddenly I reached down and there was something there that wasn't there before. And then he says, there was a faith I could actually apply and believe with. From that moment on, I knew I was secure. If you'd like, he knew he was delivered. And he wrote, I didn't, I didn't need to fear judgment or hell or anything anymore. You and I can know with assurance that we have been delivered. God knows how to rescue us and deliver us. And so, yes, like me, midweek, we need to be encouraged, no matter how well the false teachers seem to be, no matter how popular they are with the crowds who they are deceiving, there is a hope. And in the end, we take on a stand for the truth of God's word and the truth that we have through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that truth allows us to stand for him at any time and all the time. For we, here on earth, through our faith in Jesus, have been delivered through eternal punishment. The Lord knows how to, to deliver those who belong to him. 2,000 years ago, Peter was concerned. The Holy Spirit put him on his, in his heart to write this letter and write it to Christians because Peter knew that he was dying soon and there would be false teachers and false teacher, teachers teaching the wrong things. But he highlights the facts that God can deliver his children in any generation and in any situation. And so in the midst of the trials and temptations perpetuated by false teachers, you and I, we can have peace. And so let me close with this and realizing the peace we can have and the responsibility we have to share it. 
An unbelieving person asked a Christian, suppose you discover after death that there's no such place as heaven. And through the years, you've been laboring under a delusion. And the Christian responded this way, and I appreciated that. I would still be the gainer, for I've had the most wonderful, peaceful, and joyous time getting there. That Christian understood that our faith in Christ is not just about eternity, but it's about where we live right now. But that Christian was not afraid to ask the unbeliever this. And he said, suppose you, on the other hand, make a discovery after death that there is a hell. What then for you? Would you pray with me, please? I know, Lord, of the punishments that you have planned for false teachers. I know, Lord, the ache, the pain that I have for this dear friend of Sue's and mine, and the pain of her children. When mom's been led astray like this, but Father, those kids, and Sue and myself, Lord, understand the deliverance that you provide for us through our relationship with you. And so, Lord, I think of those who don't know you, punishments coming, but I pray for each one here, Lord, that they will understand that through a faith in Jesus, they are delivered now, just like in the future. Help us, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 333. The chorus we're going to sing says these words. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart, can make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see, t'was best for him to have his way with thee. Hymn number 333, we'll stand and sing together.
Heavenly Father, as we leave this place, walk with us. Allow us to walk in your ways and help us to stand firm, Father, for what we believe. We thank you for that. In Christ's name, amen.